Welcome, Mark. It is so awesome to have you here. And uh, just speaking offline, it was funny to hear of the, uh, or not funny, uh, relatable to hear of the uh, tech technology challenges you've had uh, in the last 24 hours. <laughs> That's losing, right. Losing a computer. And I was saying the same thing for myself here. I've got a make-do office and I can definitely relate to, to your experience. Maybe not losing a laptop, but, uh, you know. It's, it's hard for people setups. to understand and appreciate how much we all rely on technology until it fails us. I couldn't even log into a bank account or pay my taxes without my computer. And I'm trying to get password reset sent to an email that I have to connect up to with an iPad that I have to type with my little fingers on a flat screen. And, and then I get locked out and pretty soon you just want to tear your hair out and you just want to say, why can't I just walk to the bank? Well, cause nobody's allowed in the banks anymore. So it's all got to be online. <laughs> so yeah, you really don't, I mean, I, I, I was just I really slapped in the face by the change in how we work and our culture and how we rely on electronics and our susceptibility now to, you know, an, an EMP. I don't see how we could survive as a human race more than a, you know, a day or two if we just had all the power just shut down. We didn't have our computers. And when I was growing up, I mean, I, we didn't need any of this stuff. We, we survived just, just quite well. So it's, a, it's, it's really a testament, I think, to how much power, not just electronics, but also um, communication that goes through electronics, i.e. media has over our lives. And that's one of the themes of the book that I wrote uh, in November, United States of Fear, which is that media has really taken over and they could only have done it really with the, uh, the electronicization of our culture. So uh, it, it was a lesson for me what happened yesterday with my computer. Yeah, you've definitely nailed there with the communication, especially through messaging, uh, yeah. using social platforms and just the control mm -hmm. that it can have over – or the influence, sorry, it can influence have over Influence is a better word, yeah, exactly. Mm, it's, it's we're exactly not always right seeing, influence. seeing uh, all the sides of the story, and I listen to a fair bit of Joe Rogan, but also look at both sides of the um, – uh, both sides, both arguments, and see so many people are getting banned off social platforms for, mm -hmm. for speaking things and – um, you know, then even I went over to this other platform called Getter because people like Twitter's yeah, banning I've it. Yeah, I went on Get Yeah, went on Getter and then Getter's now posting or people on Getter are posting people getting banned. And I'm like, well, how do, how do we find the truth if people aren't wow. allowed to really see what's going on and, and have debates or conversations in a public forum, which is uh, very interesting. But let's – I really want to get into your book and I've been very excited to to listen to you speak and have this conversation with you, Mark. So you wrote the book. The United States of Fear, and you said you wrote that back mm -hmm. in November. What inspired the book for yourself? Well, I actually didn't want to write anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't think I had anything worth reading. It was really only after I had started to speak out publicly with colleagues and in front of large audiences that I kept getting strangers, really, people I'd never met before, walking up to me and saying, you need to write something. You need to publish a book. And I just kept rolling my eyes and saying, yeah, right, whatever. And it really took months, months and months and months before Simone Gold, who's a colleague and friend of mine who began the America's Frontline Doctors Group, where I got my start back in <clears throat> summer of 2020, came to me a few months after publishing her own book called I Do Not Consent. And she said, hey, you know, my editor, he called me and he said, there's this Mark McDonald guy that I keep hearing about and I see him speaking. I think he needs to write a book and I want to edit his book. <laughs> and at that point, you know, when you have a publisher asking you to write a book, I, I just couldn't say no. So I accepted and we had a chat on the phone and he gave me some really good ideas about what he thought would be um, not just a good selling book, but also a really provocative, informative book, something that would uh, hopefully wake people up. And I, I got on board and I started writing over the summer and the book finally got published in November of last year. And it's, it's really selling well, and it's being um, very well received by most people. There's always a few people who, who didn't read the book and then decided that it's um, full of misinformation. And they mm. uh, don't, don't ever want to cease telling me that through every possible electronic medium they can. But other than that crowd, which is a small number of people, I think that uh, the book has uh, really resonated with people all over the world. I, I was called to a podcast uh, by a man in South Africa a few months ago, Jeremy Nell on germ warfare. Uh, I've received comments from uh, women from Malta, uh, as well as uh, several Australian news organizations that want to make me a, a featured oh, wow. guest. Um, I think Asia Pacific 
News is the name of the uh, broadcasting group, and they uh, have, have done a lot of uh, late night interviews with me recently, and uh, they seem to, to really like the book. So I, I'm really pleased. I didn't I didn't even think that it would be uh, sold outside of my city. And, and there's copies coming out of Great Britain and France. People asking me, how do I get it in northern Africa? I don't even know how to answer some of these questions. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but take it back. Cause for me, it's like you're like a Jordan Peterson where you're speaking out about something that obviously you were, you were passionate about and very curious and interested in. Uh, but can, for everyone listening, what, what specifically was it that you were talking about and, and really sort of leading the charge in the conversation? Well, I'm a, ch- I'm a child psychiatrist, so I'm a, a professional doctor, clinician. I see children and, and young adults in a private practice who, by and large, are well. I don't see a lot of very sick people, uh, but they became all very anxious, very depressed, um, just a, a, a huge decline in their functioning in spring of 2020. And it really disturbed me because I didn't see any reason for that to happen. And as I started to look into it further and talk to teachers and parents in more detail, it was obvious to me that the children were not physically sick. They weren't suffering from an organic mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. They weren't born with OCD, but they were all declining because they were being put in this really awful and artificial environment of home quarantine. Uh, being stuck at home indefinitely, not being allowed to go to school, not being allowed to see their friends, not being able to uh, develop and advance like a normal child. And and they were really suffering from this. So I started to speak out. I started to um, publish some op-eds in local papers. And that really all led to a a more in-depth pursuit of an answer to the question that I kept getting from everyone in Los Angeles and and also when I would travel, how did this happen? How did we get here? It's clearly not happening because of a medical problem. This is not a virus that's causing our world to fall apart. It's actually the response to it. It's the government, media, and corporate response to it. Why is this happening? And why are people reacting in such a compliant fashion and actually believing that they are about to die and that they should be afraid? And there's no obvious answer to that question. So I looked back in history, cultural history, and I started to see patterns forming more subtly, more insidiously, more covertly that led me to write the first third of the book, which was really a tracing of the history over time in the United States, not around the world, but I think it applies quite well to most Western countries of the what I now call grooming effect of normalizing fear telling women and children and even men that we have so many reasons to be afraid in our modern world that we can't trust ourselves, our spouses, our friends, family, community, our church, civic organizations, and even local government to help support us in fighting the advances of nature and the threats of illness and the dissension among the ranks of our local community. We can't do that. It's, it's, it's way too difficult. It's way too scary. We need a really big, powerful authority figure, and not our father, but a father-like figure coming from on high that's going to save us and protect us and keep us safe. We've been told this by, by not just media, but also politicians, <coughs> uh, large corporations, for so many years now that when finally this virus shows up, this virus from China we were ready to accept the lie that all of us are at risk of almost immediate death unless we follow every single dictate handed down by government. That's in a nutshell what I wrote about in the first third of the book with a lot of examples and a lot of history. And later in the book, I continued to explore that in terms of male-female dynamics and also um, in the final third, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to get out of this? How are we going to get beyond fear? But in the beginning, it really was more about um, an explanation for how we got to where we are. The, the ripple effect of what you were seeing, and I believe the same here, like many children especially, but also people are missing out on, on life in general as a result yes. of giving trust to, and I'm a massive believer, I've always thought, you know, if there's a... Fifty percent of the problem can be a hundred percent of the solution. I want to make sure that I'm looking after myself to the best of my ability. And mm-hmm. you know, if and not to blame anyone, but if 
they were really serious about our health and our survival and our well-being, they'd be doing very similar things with obesity and various other things around the world that exactly. are causing us to be unhealthy. So it, I've always been curious in the conversation and I'm always open to hearing um, different sides of the debate around, you know, there's so many people marching for freedom here in Australia and I would imagine very similar in the United States and all around the world. And then there's also people who are just um, completely at trust with the government and you know, whatever mm -hmm. works for you is completely fine. However, I think from my perspective and what I've experienced over the years and also coming from your uh, your book and everything like that, like I'm definitely open-minded because you know everything can be proven wrong and this will probably be one of those times in history that in 50 years' time there'll be a book written about it and we'll have an outcome from it. Whereas at the moment it's you know really hard with all the information going around because we're living it, right? Um, to, I don't even think it's going to take 50 years. I think that this is such a momentous event and access to information is so rapid now that I suspect that what would have been a 50 year, you know, historian digging through shelves of books in the basement and writing a report on it is, is going to happen in, in lightning speed. Um, I, I expect that in a matter of just a few years, uh, we're going to have so much information available and there'll be so much publishing about this. And, and rapid um, synthesis of information that we're going to see a revelation of the reality of what happened without all the propaganda and, and the histrionics and the uh, manipulation of information and the one-sidedness, but a, a much more realistic and uh, sort, of, sort of documentary-like accounting of what's happened. Um, I, I would not be surprised if that happens very, very soon. And what do you feel, having obviously been really part of having this conversation and sharing your, your opinions and perspectives and what you're seeing, what do you feel that's going to look like when that information comes out? Like, what do you feel some of the ramifications of, of the fear through the media and the way where a lot of people are currently living? I suspect that many large groups, organized groups that we used to respect will be revealed to have intentionally caused the death and suffering of millions of people. As an example, I believe very strongly that hospitals and those who run hospitals, and unfortunately, even those who work in the hospitals, uh, will be revealed to have utterly failed their core obligations, their core ethical and moral obligations to first do no harm and to help people to survive who are sick and who are suffering. That is a big, big disappointment that I would never have even contemplated three years ago. And I am as convinced of anything that when that becomes clear and known and it, it stops being argued and pushed away, that it will encourage a reformation and perhaps even a rebuilding from the ground up of that institution, medicine, as well as other institutions that are equally corrupt and have equally failed us. I think in a general sense, the depth of sadism and sociopathy and dereliction of duty and, and fundamentally corrupt uh, and corruption of all of these institutions is going to be exposed. And it's going to, um, in, an, in an optimistic way, I think, and I'm saying this optimistically, I think it will um, cause a revival and a revitalization of a more ethical and more um, humanistic uh, culture throughout the world. Um, I would even go so far as to say that <clears throat> we have been living up until the last few years as sort of Westerners and Western countries um, in a state of decadence. And what I mean by decadence is we're living not just in affluence, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with living in affluence, but we're living in decadence, meaning that we don't want for anything. We have it too easy. We don't need to actually engage with our environment in order to survive anymore. We just have to engage with our phone and just press a button and our food gets delivered by a car. And we don't really even have to think about what goes into all of that, what went into all of that in order to build up those structures. So we mm. get divorced from the reality of life. We get divorced from the, um, the guarantee of death. We get divorced from the work that goes into actually growing and evolving and, and ultimately surviving as a human race. And when you get into that stage, I think you start to become weak. 
you start to become weak, not, not just physically weak, but I mean weak in terms of being permeable to anti-reality propaganda. And I think that's where we, where we hit in 2020. And I think that's what led us to be so able to be um, co-opted into this larger scheme that uh, didn't really think um, of us in any way. And we need to get rid of that. And I don't think there's any way to do it easily without some suffering. Mm. I, I love sort of where that was going. I look forward to exploring that a little bit more, but you're definitely right. We are living in a state of decadence. You know, we've got Uber Eats. I still remember, I don't know if Blockbuster Video was uh, in the United States or was in Australia. It was. Company. I think it started in, a, in the US. I remember yeah. going down and renting the VHS cassettes when I was in grade school. Yeah. So the, the effort, I still remember the process when we wanted to watch a film, you, you know, my dad would take me, we'd go uh, order a pizza because somehow it was always conveniently placed right next to block, Blockbuster, <laughs> you'd order a pizza and then you'd go choose a film and then you'd yeah. pick up the pizza and go home. And if you didn't like the movie, you didn't have the opportunity to just go, mm. oh, cancel, scroll. You just sit with it all, don't watch it at all. And so you had to deal with like, oh, this is frustrating. And we had to learn to just be patient and um, yeah. sit with our the outcomes that we've we've chosen. Whereas now people definitely are losing that that toughness and the ability to problem solve to think on their feet. We're waiting for someone to to do it for us. And I think the that's problem a really, solving is a great point. I think yeah. you're absolutely right. And leaving it to someone else is also an excellent point. We Americans and and, and I suppose this is true in Australia and other Western democracies. We have been. Uh, led to believe that it's not up to us to fix our problems. It's up to some other person and in the national capital. And that is a big, big mistake because when you transfer over your agency to someone else, as I say, and I often quote uh, Thoreau, an American author, when you don't think for yourself anymore, then others will start to think for you. And more importantly, they will not be thinking of you. They're going to be thinking of themselves. Exactly. I think that's an excellent point. And it, it wasn't rapid. This didn't happen overnight. This happened over years and years and years until we reached a point where when we had a real threat and we had to circle the wagons and stand up for ourselves and our loved ones and our families, we just sat back and we said, well, we don't know how to do that. So tell us what to do from Washington. Tell us what to do from Canberra. That is not the, the way that a successful people responds to a crisis. Going off... Um everything that we've sort of just been touching on and, and really getting people to step up and take ownership. It's really something that I've focused on in my life and I continually love having people share their own experiences of how they've taken ownership and responsibility in their own life. It could be from their finances to their health. Uh, but in respect to our conversation, it's more so about the, uh, sorry, the materials that they're consuming or the information that they're consuming. And almost going to that next level and doing some due diligence because many people believe that whatever they see on Facebook or even whatever the news shows them now is 100% accurate. And I know for a fact, I've done a lot of research and been on the other side of um, things like that from the media where it's bull a lot of it's just there to get money or get eyes on things and they're pushing an agenda. Everyone you know, has some form of agenda and some people it's to manipulate and not do the best by people. And then there's other people who are on the flip side who are pushing against that. They're trying to get people to wake up and say, Hey, look, yes, maybe a hundred years ago, they were doing the best for you. Maybe even not that, but now it's time to really step up and take ownership. If your life's not going the way it wants to, if your mental health struggling because you're continuing to see, you know, fear-based stuff on the news or on the radio, you need to start, you know, taking ownership and accountability for that. But I guess the, the mental health effect, all of that sort of stuff, and I'm sure we'll dive into the, the fear the pandemic's had on people, but how do you, you are encouraging, sorry, people over there to look after their mental health and their mental well-being? Well, you're actually jumping into one of the steps in a book that I just started writing right before my laptop disappeared when I was flying back from Texas to Los Angeles a few days ago. Um, the book is uh, tentatively going to be titled Freedom from Fear, a 12-step plan or program for an individual and national recovery. And it is aimed at the fear addict. And it is modeled after the 12-step program of AA, which is well-known around the world, as well as Jordan B. Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, which she cited at the beginning of our conversation. And one of the steps is actually 
to avoid the addict. I'm sorry, avoid the dealer. You are the addict. And when I say dealer, <laughs> what I what I mean, and you have to avoid other addicts too, but eventually um, the, the most important thing to accomplish is to avoid the dealer. And the dealer is the one who's actually giving you the drug. And in this case, the drug is fear. And the fear is coming from the media. So if you're addicted to fear, just like if you're addicted to alcohol or other drugs, one of the most important things that you do is to cut off the source of the drug. And that means shutting down all of this, this addictive fear porn that's coming through our airwaves and our phones and our computers. Because if you don't do that, you have to be really strong to be able to resist it. Many people can't. And if you're already addicted, forget it. You know, if you have an, an alcohol problem and you've stopped drinking and then you, you you walk by a bar because it's on your way to work, the likelihood you're going to go into that bar is, is really high. The likelihood you're going to drink is really high. You have to avoid walking past the bar so that you don't get um, seduced back into drinking alcohol. And media are really good right now. I mean, unbelievably, phenomenally good at seducing you. The algorithms that they use, the psychology behind the alerts, the likes, the hearts, the pings, the we have a suggestion for you. Why don't you go look at this page? And you go, oh, I, I pulled out of my pocket. I, well, there's, it's a suggestion. I mean, I, I guess I better look at it. Or you post something and then you get a ping. You have 230 more likes. Wow, that's amazing. Let's see who liked me. And then you go check that out. And one of them is this really hot girl who's uh, holding um, a new makeup kit because she's selling it. And you're like, oh, she's hot, but I don't really use makeup. Oh, but there's more. And it just keeps going on and on and on. And pretty soon, you know, your whole day is lost. It, it really is like a drug. I mean, the media and, and a drug dealer, I think, are a, a really um, accurate and reflective duo. So I think looking at this like an addiction, just like any addict, mm. is a really good way to address this as a mental health concern. Because if we don't start with reality, as I say to my patients, if we don't start with what's actually happening, which is a, a seductive, um, uh, overriding the rational thought process, candy selling and candy pushing by the media, then I don't think that we're really going to be able to solve this problem. So shut down the media do a media holiday and then see how it feels. See how much you start to gravitate towards books and conversation and being outdoors. It will revitalize your life. The alternative is to just keep passively accepting what's fed to you. And I don't think that that's really a solution. What would you say to someone who says you're just avoiding what's going on in the world or you're being naive? Because I personally don't follow along with the news or anything anymore. I realized a number of years ago it was having a detrimental effect on my life and my well-being. So I was like, I'll just you know, search for stuff when I need it. Or, But what I've since known is I've spent more time watching – sorry, reading books and doing things that are actually going to improve my life because there's so many things that we get – force fed or try to be made fearful of that doesn't directly impact our life at all. Like as much as it's yeah. a global pandemic, for example, with COVID what's happening in France doesn't directly affect me or, and it's not to yeah. be an asshole, but it just, if as much as other people are struggling around the world, should we all um, feel sad and anxious because of what's going on around the world? Yes, we can help, but a lot of the things we can't directly do so why not make the best of our you know our own lives and impact those that we do have the ability to um, add value to and improve their quality of life well you're, you're hitting on a really important psychological um, underpinning of a a great strategy and the underpinning and I, if i'll try to simplify it is really um a conflict or a choice between passive living and active living and I don't mean in terms of movement, physical movement. I mean passive in terms of receptive, waiting for things to come to you, meaning information, or you actively choosing to go out and search for information that you want. Very similar to the blockbuster video idea. You go out and you choose a movie. You are committed to that movie for 24 hours. There's no other option unless you want to drive back to the store again, right? And, and buy another one or rent another one. But then you've got to pay another rental fee. You can't just swap it out. So it, 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 it encourages you to think in advance, what is it that I want? 
and then to go out and get it. And if you can't get what you want, then you go do something else. Same thing with food. If you choose what you want to eat and you go out and you make a list and you go out and buy what you're going to eat, that's very different than just wandering into the store, going to the checkout counter and saying, oh, those chips look good. Oh, those candies look good. Uh, that, that sugar um, toffee looks good. Well, you know why it's all sitting at the cash register and you go out of the line. It's placed there so that you will just receive it right before you buy whatever it is in your cart. This is all intentional. It's all manipulated. Same thing with media. When you come home, you have all these shows that come on. You, you, don't, want, you don't know what you want to watch. So what do you do? You go to Netflix and then Netflix says, trending, number, number two movie. Well, mm. it's number two movie. It must be good. And then you start to press play. You would never have chosen that movie, right? Same thing uh, with the way that you would... Um, receive news. So if you want to learn about something, I want to know what's going on in Uganda today. Great. Go look for Ugandan news. But if you just sit there and wait for stuff to be pushed into you, then you have lost the ability to choose. You've given up your agency. So I think mm -hmm. overall, what I'm, what I'm saying in general about life, it's not just media, but it's about food, diet, exercise, uh, activities, is if you sit and reflect and contemplate and actively decide how you want to build your life, then you will go out and find the things that match your philosophy rather than someone else pushing stuff onto you. So I think the critique that you raised, um, which is, well, you just, you're just withdrawing. You're just not getting involved. You're, you're avoiding things. It's actually just the opposite. If you cut off all this crap, all the stuff that's being pushed at you, all the junk food at the register, all of the Netflix fed crappy movies, all of the junk news that goes through Yahoo news and, and, and uh, Facebook news um, and Yelp news, all this, this nonsense. And you sit down and you ask yourself, what is it that I want to learn about today? And you go out and grab it. You're not avoiding anything. You're actually facing things head on. You're being conscious. You're being um, oriented towards a choice that you have made rather than allowing someone else to make that choice. And it is a lot harder to control somebody who is actively thinking and pursuing versus somebody yeah. who's just lying back and waiting for the next thing to show up. Why do you feel, and I, I back that 1000%, I think we need to start being more responsive and going out and getting what we want from our life. And there is so much information coming at us that it can be information. Ah, so it can be overwhelming. So we need to sift through the bullshit and find out mm -hmm. what's probably relevant to our life and what we want and leave the other stuff. But why do you feel so many people aren't taking responsibility for their life or aren't um, waking up to what's really going on because around them now? They're still just... It's simple because it's easier to be taken care of than to go out and act as a free individual and to embrace your own liberty and your own potential. People are intrinsically, intrinsically, like biologically, genetically, developmentally attracted to and seduced by the promise of being taken care of. That's why people do this. Now, you, of course, you could ask, well, why didn't it happen 20, 30, 50, 70 years ago? That's actually a more interesting question because clearly we haven't been lying around being taken care of all of the time, this is really something that's gotten worse more recently. And, and getting back to the affluence issue and the decadence issue, I think that has a lot to do with it. When you are not regularly challenged, when other people are making decisions or offering to make decisions for you all of the time and very easily, it leaves you in this position of not really needing to go out and make an effort, not needing to be disciplined. Other people are deciding what the parameters are on your behalf, and you're only too happy to allow them to do that because it makes your life easier, at least in the short run. So I think there's been a cultural shift towards a setup where people are intrinsically drawn to an easy life, to be being taken care of, but there's always been a kind of counterbalance up until recently, which is the real world. I mean, I would... I would love as many other people to just sort of lie around in a cabin, you know, at the top of the mountains, away from all the distractions and the noise, and just have food sort of delivered to me. Um, the heat goes on and off when I wish for it. Uh, I, I feel lonely. A, a wonderful conversation partner shows up. And then when I'm tired of talking to him, he just knows when to leave. I mean, these are fantasies that we have. And if, if we could get that, if that, that could actually happen, that's where we would be. But if I go to a cabin right now up in the, in the top of the mountain, it gets cold. 
I've got to go get some wood. If I'm bored, I've got to go find a book or, or, or start playing some music. If I feel um, that I'm uh, losing uh, energy because I'm not moving and exercising, I've got to go out and start uh, climbing some trees and running around and doing some exercise. So <laughs> reality is going to break that fantasy that I have that I can just lie there and things are going to be taken care of. But no longer do we live like that. Most people living in urban areas in the United States and other Western countries really can have almost everything that they need taken care of for them mm. without even leaving their homes. It's too seductive is what I'm saying. It's too easy. This is why I have a lot of problems with the idea that we should have legalized drugs without any restrictions. I mean, I, I understand the libertarian argument for that, but it's also very dangerous to offer highly, highly seductive stuff to a population that doesn't have the discipline to actually make their own decisions and resist it. So it's, it's an interesting argument, you know, that's raised. Well, then you have a patriarchal government that's making decisions for you. Well, that's true. On the other hand, if the government doesn't issue any regulations on things that um, really can overwhelm people very quickly, <laughs> isn't that also just as dangerous? And I think right now we've, we've just, we've got actually the worst of both worlds. We've got a government that isn't instituting limits on highly seductive stuff, and they're actually colluding with the purveyors of the drugs. They're, they're, they're colluding with big tech. They're colluding with big pharma. They're colluding with Amazon. So that the, the opposition to all of that, which would be, for example, small businesses that are actually developing relationships where you can buy and sell stuff in your neighborhood, or going out and shopping at a real store, or getting healthy food, or reading a book rather than getting news fed through a news feed, all of those things, all of those more healthy options aren't even available for us to choose anymore. They're all being crushed. They're being actively destroyed by this cabal, this, this collusion between government and large industries and big tech. So we are at such a disadvantage now. I mean, if you want to go out and, and, and get a book, you want to get healthy food, you want to exercise, you want to read something that's authentic, you want to go shop to a local store, even if you wanted to, you couldn't do it because they're all gone. They've all been destroyed. So I think we're at a really bad, bad turning point in history where our worst impulses are being taken advantage of by larger powers and we are being infantilized um, to some degree against our will. So in... Leading back into that then for someone who's sitting there and it's they're going, yeah, I can definitely see how this is playing out. What would, you know, whether it's through the book or what would be one thing that you feel that we could do today or tomorrow, but in the near future to sort of start taking control and ownership for, for what happens next? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to be acknowledging of your role. If you're addicted to something, you have to accept that you are an addict. You have to accept that you've lost control and that you are using it despite <clears throat> harm. And that is the definition of addiction, loss of control and use despite harm. And you know, every addict says two things that are both lies. I can stop anytime and it's not hurting me. <laughs> I mean, that, that is the definition of addictive behavior and addictive thinking. And all addicts are dishonest. All addicts are liars. It's not a criticism, it's just, it's just a fact. And so for, for us, people who are really suffering from an addiction to um, big government, media, fear, the first thing you have to do is you have to get honest. You have to take accountability. If you don't start from a position of accountability, there's no solution because nobody's going to come and save you. There is no group of, of individuals that are going to come and fix your problems. You have to fix your own problems. So I think the first thing is to be honest and take accountability for where you've strayed. Once you've done that, then you can start to set up a plan of action on how to help yourself. And I don't mean going and saving the world. Most people start with saving the world and their, their, their own, as Jordan B. Peterson would say, why would you take advice from a guy who's, whose bedroom is a mess? He's got to clean up his own bedroom first, make his own bed, get, him, get his own house in order before he goes and tells other people where it's at. So you, get, you have to get your own house in order. You might say, well, that's really hard. I don't know how to do that. Well, then, then what you do is you, you reach out, seek out, and build relationships with like-minded people. And I say that in the last chapter of my book, United States of Fear. One of the first things you need to do is find like-minded people, people who are rational, people who are holding themselves accountable, people who honor truth, people who are compassionate. 
These people will help you to resist the addiction. Get rid of all the other druggies that you're hanging out with. You want to stop pot smoking? Stop going down to the skate park with all the skate punks that are running around, you know, doing bongs. Like they are not going to help you out. <clears throat> they, they are going to be telling you, you know, ah, forget it. And your parents say you got to stop using drugs. Oh, come on. It's much better out here getting high. Yeah, I guess he's right. And then the seduction process starts again. So you have to make these, these, these efforts, these steps, these conscious decisions to be honest, take accountability and surround yourself with other people who are doing the same. Once you do that, my goodness, there's so much more power that you can attain and there's so much more power you can achieve. And then all these other seductive threats and all the nonsense, they start to become weaker, their effect wanes, and you start to be able to push back against it. And then you start to grow yourself physically, mentally, emotionally. And once you start to feel good, you start to think well, and you start to, to be healthy again, you're going to be much, much less likely to be, seduced, to be seduced back in that unhealthy environment. A lot of people don't realize how good they can actually feel once they move away from these things. So true. We've had... We've, we've grown up generally, you know, I used to watch cartoons and I'm sure a lot of people listening or yourself may have watched cartoons sure. but in between that's ad breaks where you're seeing maybe breaking news or whatever it is. And it's, it's been conditioned and fed to us from a young age as yes. obviously you were talking about working with children. So yeah, a lot of people are rolling through life, whether they've been passive or responsive, but most people are passive in, mm-hmm. even in the work line of work that I do. Um, and they don't think for themselves. And one of the, I guess, driving factors behind this podcast and what I do is to get more people to wake up and start thinking for themselves, to take yes. ownership, to take responsibility, because when you're in that position, life is only going to get better and better and better. Mm-hmm. And it's that, that amazing compound effect. At the beginning, it's sketchy. It's, it's scary. And it doesn't feel like you're achieving any momentum or any results. It would be, let's say, Mark, fitness is a, a great one. If you took a photo of yourself every day, much like we see ourselves naked every day when we go to the shower, you don't notice your body changing, but many men or many people wake up in 10 years' time and they're fat, they're yes. obese. They're like, oh, geez, that last week's got me. It's like, no, it's been the, the patterns <laughs> for the last however long that have slowly crept up on you, much like yeah. if you slowly consume poor content or you you get your – social belonging and a lot of your environmental uh, feedback from s- Facebook, for example, a lot of that is got a hidden agenda and it's not there to make you feel good. It's there to make you stay on the platform. So if you're reading these stupid articles that have, you know, some incredible writer who's grabbed you with a tagline or a um, punchy line, it's like you've just been sucked in again. And then you're going to go tell your mate, did you read this article? And they'll go, that's not actually real if they're you know, onto it and it just keeps going on. So what do you feel social media's role in this fear, fear sort of bubble, especially probably more to kids and, and adolescents yeah. is. Well, I would actually state that the beginning of the decline of health in children was punctuated by the release of the first smartphone which was back in 2007 with the iPhone. That was the year that I graduated from medical school. I remember it because I got that phone. It was so cool. I had had a flip phone for years and years. And I mean, being able to send text messages was amazing, you know, on a flip phone, being able to call people from your car. And then the iPhone came out. And that was really what changed everything because now you could not just send only text messages, you could send photos, you could do <laughs> videos. You could you could do all of this really interesting interactive media that was never available on one of those little digital phones. It just had a, a character pad, and this revolutionized everything. I mean, absolutely everything. And over time, you know, now we have iPhone. What we're up to like eleven or twelve now. There's like over a dozen iterations yeah. of this thing. Multiple cameras. You. Know, you you have a computer in your hand now that was never even possible 15 or 20 years ago. And unfortunately, what's it, it, what it's really done with, to children is it, is it is divorced children from being able to live in a real world. They live in a fantasy world. And the reflections of themselves that they get back from other people are no longer real. Uh, they don't get a, you know, you stink 
uh, and your clothes are dirty when they go to school and they go, oh, you're right. I got to go, go change. Uh, mm. They don't get a, wow, that's amazing. You hit that ball really hard. You're the strongest athlete in our class. Yeah, you're right. That's true. There isn't any honest feedback anymore. Everything that comes back at them is a, a kind of uh, a cultivated and um, propagandized and marketed view of others in the world. It's curated, basically. And it's not, it's not authentic. And that leads you to not being able to get good signals back about what you're doing well and what you're doing poorly. You're not getting good feedback. And that creates all sorts of problems. I mean, imagine if you were to go into a, um, a fun house and go into the mirror room and, and you're trying to figure out uh, whether you're fat, short, uh, thin, um, oddly shaped, long nose, big nose, big fat head. There's no way that you would be able to tell because every time you look in the mirror, you get this different um, stretched out image of your body. You can't even walk around because you get disequilibrated. This is kind of how, how, how children are living, except instead of random sort of weird mirrors and funhouse stuff, every single reflection that's coming back to them is very carefully thought out and carefully disseminated just to them in order to get them to behave in a certain way, often with buying things and spending money. And unfortunately, the end result of all of this is that boys and girls both develop incredibly unstable and fragile emotional shells that are very, very easily ruptured because they're not getting the feedback from their real natural environment. This, of course, is a problem for adults as well. But the change that I've seen in kids in the last 10 years about their emotional fragility, their um, difficulty in being able to um, go out and explore, their expression of curiosity. In curiosity, talk about a casualty in this war. I've often said in the last few months that if you want to assess very quickly whether somebody is able to reach an authentic state of being or critique or um, evaluate the world in any way that is even semi-rational, assess their curiosity. Most people have lost curiosity, including children. If you don't have curiosity anymore, then you are, you are really in a passive receptive state. You don't have any um, armor to resist attacks of things being pushed into you. And so many children now, they don't even want to look around the room and grab a toy. They just want to grab a phone so they can just stare at the screen. And that's because they've lost their sense of curiosity. And people who aren't curious are very, very easily manipulated because all that you need to do to manipulate someone who isn't curious is find the, the tune in to the frequency of what their emotional state is. You know, fear, um, lust, anger, jealousy, envy, or maybe even nudge them in one of those directions and then feed them some information that resonates with that emotional state and then offer them a product and then redirect them to another site. And pretty soon you're off to the races. This is really yeah. a problem. That really worries me as well that people are losing curiosity, even to the point where I was having a conversation with someone the other day. And I, actually, I'll just give it a different example. But when people get injured or, um, you know, they, we, we've lost the ability, sorry, to be resourceful. Yes. If we don't have something or don't have access to something, we don't think, well, how can I achieve that or how can I do that? We, we don't get curious about thinking outside of the box. You know, some common things that I feel is like, I can't afford that. I'll never be able to do that. And mm -hmm. that's the way we think until we're told otherwise. And we rely so heavily upon that external validation rather than going, well, how about I just get curious? Because when you're a kid, I love watching uh, my nephew. Just everything is the greatest thing he's ever seen. And I was playing table tennis with him a few months ago and it was a really rough experience for me because he couldn't hit the ball back, but he just kept <laughs> wanting me to, to, to hit it at him. He was so yeah. excited about getting so close. And I feel if we can take that approach, maybe not with uh, table tennis, but other areas of our life, things that are really important, like how can I um, make my mental health better? How can I improve my relationships? How can I earn the money that I want to earn? How can I create that lifestyle? We'll start noticing different things that start making sense or, you know, we'll, we'll, pick up on things like I would highly encourage anyone who's listening to this, listen to this podcast and then listen to it again. I guarantee you, you'll pick up something else because what you've sort of 
resonated with right now, you're going to probably go do some more research and you'll come back with a greater level of understanding and the next bit will be what you're curious about. And I think that's the one beautiful thing about podcasts is many people listening are hopefully not just passengers, but they're doing something this with it, sorry, doing something with this information. And I, I yeah, I'm really worried for a lot of people out there who have lost that that curiosity within their life. They say they're bored um, all the time. Children often yeah. bored, bored, bored. Adults bored, bored, bored. How can you be bored? I, I've never been bored. I mean, maybe I was when I was a little kid for five minutes, and then my parents said, "Oh, you you're bored? Well, I'll tell you something to be bored about." And I'm like, "No, I'm not bored. <laughs> yeah. Not bored anymore." But people are bored, and 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 when people are bored, then someone will show up with some little tantalizing bobble to say, "No, I know how to to get you out of your boredom. Why don't you try mm. this?" And of course, yep. it's not in their best interest, but they respond because they don't know how to generate passion and interest and curiosity on their own. I remember a conversation that I had with a radio show host here out in Los Angeles uh, with Dennis Prager, who was talking about, he was talking about boring dates that he had had when he was growing up. And he said, I kept going on boring dates. And I asked myself this question, how is it that I can be bored on a date with a woman? And so he decided, I'm going to make this an investigation. I'm going to, I'm going to think about this like an archaeologist. When I sit down at the table and I notice that I'm bored, I'm going to ask myself the question, what is it about this person, this woman, that's so boring? And he did this what? multiple times <laughs> until he, 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 he realized that the one, the one similarity between all of the boring women was that not one of them expressed any passion for anything. No passion. And passion and curiosity are, are sort of, they overlap. When you're with someone that doesn't have any passion or when you're with someone that's not curious, you are with a boring person and you will start to feel bored. And so look in the mirror and ask yourself that question. Am I that person? Am I the person that's not curious, that's lost curiosity, the one that's not passionate, the one that's sitting at the dinner table expressing through my eyes and my body language the command, entertain me, wake me up, Show me something fun and interesting because you're not doing it yourself, the receptive, passive one. Are you that person? Have you become that person? If you have, mm. it's time to own up and it's time to start to develop curiosity and passion because if you don't, you're going to become a very miserable person and the really interesting people that are doing stuff, the creative and passionate, they're not going to want to be around you because they don't want to be swimming in that pool of boredom. That's so well said. Many people, because I am always going and I feel like I'm curious and I feel where a lot of my curiosity comes from is the fact that I have an idea of what I want for my life, but I'm also very aware of things that I can improve that maybe will improve what I do or you know how I feel about life. So I'm, I love learning and I, I feel you would be very similar, Mark. And within the learning obviously stems curiosity, which is a, a beautiful thing. So there's many people who sit back and go, I don't, you know, I'm bored. It's like, well, think about your life and what's not fucking working well for you at the moment. Because I guarantee you, even for people whose lives are amazing, there's still stuff we can improve on. It might be communication within your relationship. It might be, um, you know, going from work to home. You might be a bit stressed some days and that might be what you need to work on. There's so many factors and things that we can improve upon, but we just go, nah, I'm bored. And then when we find ourselves with nothing to do, it's like, all right, I'll jump back on this bad thing of social media and keep reading the poor material that's got me yes. feeling terrible in the first place. What do you hope people take away from your book, Mark? Well, there's a few things. It's, it's, a, it's really um, meant to give people a roadmap from the past to the present and then a roadmap from the present to the future. So what I'd like for people to take away is fear is largely responsible for what's been driving all of the misery, the decay, the suffering, the death, the loss of liberty over the last three years. It's largely been driven by fear. Fear is not necessarily an emotion that we must act on. We have been driven for so many years now by our feelings that we've forgotten that our feelings are just information. We can decide to take action, not because of our feelings, but in spite of our feelings. Take back ownership of your life by acknowledging and respecting your feelings, but acting in spite of them, particularly when the feelings are destructive. If we can do that, if we can start to act 
as fearless people, even if we are fearful, can you imagine what we can accomplish and how much we can push back against evil? That's an incredibly powerful force that we all have. Being courageous is not genetic and it's not something that you go to the gym for. Being courageous is nothing more than a decision. It's simply a decision that you make that you're going to take the correct action in spite of risk. That's it. Nothing more. And pretty soon it becomes a habit. We are so caught up in fear and we are so risk averse and we are so worshiping on the altar of safety that we are, we are willing to allow ourselves to lead a life of emptiness and lack of meaning so that we can put on our gravestone, here lies Mark McDonald. He led a safe life. Well, you know what? I don't want that on my gravestone. I want to live a full life. And if you want to live a full life, you have to stop worshiping safety and you have to start taking risks. You have to face your fears. You have to act in spite of your feelings. This is so important on an individual level, but on a mass cultural level, if we all did this as individuals, it would change our world dramatically, very, very quickly. Love that. Really, really love that. So where can people find the book, Mark? So the book is available in most countries that have Amazon service or Barnes and Noble service online. If you don't have access to delivery on Amazon or Barnes and Noble for books, you can also buy an electronic version of it. Uh, so it is available electronically. And I am going to be working on an audible version very, very shortly. Awesome. So for people who don't want to read, that just want to listen, like podcasting people that want to listen, that should be out as well. I don't have a time frame, but we, we are getting that going. So that's also good. And if you are you going to be reading that person, I am, I insisted that I'm yes. going to be the one reading the book. Good. I told, I told the publisher, we're not going to do it unless I'm the one reading it. And they agreed. So we've got that going. And if anybody just wants to read more about me and what I'm publishing and get links to where to buy the book, but you only really have to remember one thing, dissident MD. My website is called dissidentmd.com. And that's also the name of my new Substack writing where I'm publishing once a week articles on things like sadism and loss of freedom and dependency, big, big, big issues, big topics, but focusing on giving evidence and data and information about what's happening right now this week, but in a, in a sort of a, a top down big picture uh, point of view. So dissident MD. And if you're also interested in the podcast that I work on, I have one that I put out several times a week with Dr. Jeff Barkey, who's a colleague of mine, a family practice doctor just south of me in Orange County, California. Uh, and it's called Informed Dissent. And you can find Informed, Informed Dissent. Dissent on just about any podcasting site available, you know, Apple and, and all the other big ones. We have a website called informeddissentmedia.com as well, where we have uh, clips and in interviews and articles and places where I'm speaking. Uh, so just remember Dissident MD and Informed Dissent, and you should be able to find everything from there. The, the easiest thing for anyone listening or watching on YouTube is go straight down below and I'm sure all the links will be there and you can just click Fantastic. and it will pop up. It'll Fantastic. be super easy. Yeah. I have one last question, Mark, which I love to ask all of, all of my guests, which is what does it mean to be a man to, to, oh, to you? Oh, wow. That's a great question and it's a really important one. And I address some of that in my book in the middle section of the book on masculinity oh, and perfect. femininity, which is a huge component of what I see is the underlying cultural war against masculinity, which is going to way, way, way last beyond this whole pandemic. And I think it actually underlines a lot of the problems that we have now. To be a man requires leadership more than anything. And it requires fearlessness. We have been told that as men, we should not be leaders. We should be receptive. We should be passive. And that as men, we should not take risks. We should allow those risks to be taken by others. That is a recipe for disaster. That is a recipe for the end of masculinity. And when masculinity wanes as it has in the last few years, certainly since 2020, a vacuum develops and women step into that vacuum and they don't step into it with masculinity. They step into it with hysteria. Masculine men, strong, fearless, leadership oriented men are necessary, not just for men, it's also necessary for women because that's what women need to men need women, women need men, and they both need to be polarized. We need men and women to be 
off the zero point on the number line. We need space between them. We need differentiation. And the more differentiation we have, the more power the male and the more power the female has. And with that power, we come together and we, we make wonderful creatures called children. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mark. And once again, thank you for your time. It's been uh, incredible. I'm definitely going to be tuning into your podcast and reading a few of your articles because I've thoroughly enjoyed enjoyed the chat. We've got Australians on the podcast, by the way, too. Perfect. Yeah, we had one on the run, run, actually, in a trailer. She was podcast. Really? Yeah, she she was she was uh, Wi-Fiing it through a trailer uh, on the run <laughs> because the uh, the police were after her, trying to arrest her as an insurrectionist. So we wow. really interesting. She's, I think she's known pretty, pretty well uh, in, in Australia um, and uh, she's on the run. So we've got that podcast that came out about maybe three or four weeks ago. Um, interesting. I'm going to go back and listen to yeah. that and then we'll have a stalk <laughs> on the socials. 